Calling to order the regular meeting of the Albany Unified School District. Reconvening to open session. May we have a roll call, please? Superintendent Wells. Present. Board President Trutain. Here. Board Vice President Dron. Presente. Or here. <laughs> Trustee Clark. Here. Trustee Doss. Here. Trustee Hinckley. Here. Student board member Weinstein. Here. Student board member Mela. Here. Thank you. Uh, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance if you'd like to join us. I'd like to ask our student board members to read the AUSD mission and vision statement and our new meeting norms. The mission of Albany Unified School District is to provide excellent public education that empowers all to achieve their fullest potential as productive citizens. AUSD is, com is committed to creating comprehensive learning opportunities in a safe, supportive, and collaborative environment addressing the individual needs of each student. Meeting norms maintain a focus on what is best for our students. Ensure a safe environment for all views to be expressed, treating each other, staff, and the public respectfully. Endeavor to find common solutions to issues through collaboration without sacrificing one's belief in what is best for students. Make a commitment to effective deliberation, each one listening with an open mind while others are allowed to express their points of view. Thank you. Thank you. That brings us to um, number five, report of action taken in closed session. There was no action, reportable action taken in closed session. And moves us to item six, approval of the agenda. Uh, board, are there any requests for changes on the agenda? If not, can I get a motion? I move to approve the agenda. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, board. And that brings us to our spotlight. Superintendent, would you like to introduce? Um, thank you, Madam President. I will turn the in wonderful introduction over to our principal here at Marin, uh, Melissa Poo. Good evening, everyone. I Come on and join me, Dr. Chem. Yeah. Um, good evening, and thank you for taking the time to spotlight Marin Elementary School this evening. I have the extreme pleasure of introducing um, Charles Medved, also known at Marin as Coach M. Uh, Coach M is an esteemed, was an esteemed third grade teacher for several years at Marin, and this year stepped up to fill a spot um, teaching PE, and he's done a fantastic job of taking what he knows about students, child development, and the demands of the classroom. He's taken all that onto the playground to support children's social emotional uh, well-being in addition to their physical health um, and support them in working through conflicts and he's going to tell you all about it so hey coach M take it away uh, hello um, I have a little presentation that I'd like to give and I know I have 15 minutes so I'll try to be uh, respectful of the time so, again, uh, as uh, uh, Principal Poole introduced me, my name is Coach M, or Charles Medved, and I'm the uh, physical education teacher at Marin Elementary. So, first, a little bit about me. Uh, this is my seventh year teaching. Uh, I started off teaching middle school special education, followed by kindergarten, which I thought was the most challenging thing to teach, and then third grade for four years, which I absolutely loved, and now PE. 
Uh, at Moreno Elementary, um, seasonally, I also do the chess club. Um, and I kind of model it off of Rebecca Springer at Ocean Views uh, Way, where she has a tournament format, and there's five trophies. Uh, I also run the seasonal acting club, which is basically improv sports. Um, and I also worked for a little bit at the Berkeley School of Chess. There was a, a, a student in my classroom, and her mom was a director and got me a job there, so I got some fun experience there. I've also taken a lot of improv classes, and recently I took mus musical improv. I'm kind of excited to try that in the acting club. Um, for physical hobbies, I quite enjoy movement, and then also dance and rock climbing. Uh, martial arts, and then uh, nature adventures. Um, two summers ago, I also went to India and I became a certified uh, Hatha yoga teacher in Rishikesh, India. And I've been studying and passing a lot of tests to become a science teacher uh, in the future. Uh, I'd like to next talk about the importance of physical education or just what I personally believe my values is as I'm going into teaching this. Uh, for me, it's on a core level, I would I really like to teach just the enjoyment of movement and finding play in movement, um, because I feel if you enjoy just moving, you're, you're, you'll get off the couch. But if you feel it's really difficult and hard, then uh, you're not going to do much. So at a core level, just enjoying moving. And if you can do that, uh, we're all kind of like a mind body spirit thing. We're all minds in a body, and. There's so much thinking in this world and so much stress and such. It is very important to balance out uh, both the mind and the body. And if you can find somewhere in the middle that harmony between the two, um, then just from a health standpoint, uh, your body is just optimized and you work better. Um, another very important thing for me is collaboration, learning, and also finding healthy competition. Um, I think there's just too many examples in society um, with toxic capitalism or can't Compe uh, capitalism becoming toxic, or um, certain corporative corporation cultures becoming toxic, um, that it's important to try to uh, teach that competition, there is a way that it can be toxic, but it can also be very healthy, and it can be positive and constructive. And uh, we play a lot of com competitive games in PE, and even within competitive games, there's an intrinsic collaborative aspect where there's the rules, everyone agrees and abides by the rules, and even not the explicit rules, like I didn't say not to push the kid on the ground, right? And there's a certain amount of collaboration that goes into any game that's very important and that gets taught in PE. Also, health and wellness, as we all know, PE exercise is very good for health, very good for just happiness and wellness. And kind of leads into just, for me, it's really important to create those happy memories and experiences. Um, this is my first year teaching PE. And uh, I've been telling all my friends, oh, I'm starting to do PE this year. And the first thing they say is, oh, I, uh, uh, they tell me about all their positive experiences of PE, this and that and that. And it's very clear that PE, I'm basically the giver of fun. I distribute all the fun at the school, so I have a very important role not to mess that up. I have to make sure that fun gets delivered. Um, yeah. Uh, next, just a little quick overview of what we do at Marin. Um, in August, I start with rules and routines, and personally, I see myself as a strict teacher, but fair. Fair, but strict, strict, but fair. And I always make sure that I really explain the rules and why the rules are the rules. Uh, and I do make sure that the rules get followed. Um, and then that leads to collaborative games. And I don't start with any competitive games. I make sure collaborative games starts off uh, for the first month. And when I first started this year, all the kids were whining, just like, oh, come on, give me a com competitive game, please. But I made sure that it was collaborative. Um, and they did, I did find that uh, most of the kids, they really did enjoy the collaborative aspect because they got to just have fun and laugh and such. Uh, then in October, we do an introduction to competition. And we just dip our toes at first, a very light competition game. And if they can do that, it kind of ramps up a little bit. And that kind of lends itself to tagging games, which is no equipment, just very simple competition. Then it goes to throwing and mechanics. Um, and dodgeball-ish games. We don't play dodgeball per se. I know a lot of people have uh, different views on dodgeball. Some people absolutely love it. It was their childhood favorite experience. 
Other people, they think it's uh, not a game to be played at school. Um, I don't feel you need to play the straight dodgeball game. I'm also just don't want to get in trouble and I just like to avoid conflict. So I uh, do games with dodgeballs, but no one actually gets targeted. Um, baseball, it's baseball season. It's always fun to do games while the kids are watching that, those things at home. Um, same with soccer. Uh, the National Women's Soccer uh, League happens during that time. Um, and then scooter board games, that's one of my favorite things to teach. Uh, there's just so many creative things you can do and it becomes very fun. Uh, next, I have some pictures of uh, some of the games we play. Here, this is uh, one of the first collaborative games we play. This game is called Farmer Squish. And basically, I tell all of them, um, Farmer M, that's me, uh, I have my farm field. And it's important not to squish my farm, uh, my fruits. I really love my fruits. And I go into detail, like, there's my carrot, there's my cauliflower. And basically, the point of the game is one kid covers his own eyes, and the other kid is kind of a trust exercise, leads them through the farm field. And they try not to bump into things. And then they go through the hoops at the end with um, verbal communication, which teaches the collaborative aspect and just communication. And at the very end, they get glory, where they get chalk. They get to write their names big on the blacktop. And uh, they just revel and celebrate in the collaborative teamwork. Uh, this was actually the very first comp competitive game. And I really wanted to do parachute because my um, memorable, nostalgic, sentimental memory from uh, elementary PE was the parachute. And I know a lot of people do remember that as well. Just you go under it and all the vivid colors. So I wanted to make sure we did that. And we did all of those. And then at the very end, this was the very first competitive game where they get to dip their toe into it. And this is a game called Cat and Mouse, where on the top, you can see the kid um, on top of the parachute. And they're the mouse, or sorry, they're the cat searching for the mice. And there's students under the parachute who are the mice. Uh, this is a dodgeball-ish game. And the point of the, this game is called Boom Boom Ball. Um, I didn't name it that. I actually got this off online. And uh, a little anecdote. I was teaching this. This, this game works for kindergarten to fifth grade. And a lot of the grades were chuckling. I'm like, what's going on? And this kindergarten class was just laughing hysterically. I'm like, OK, w why is this so funny? And they're like, you don't know what a boom boom is? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> and apparently, uh, that's what parents tell their kids when they want to potty train them. Please take a boom boom. <laughs> And so I was like, oh, to me, it's called boom, boom, ball, because boom, boom, the ball. And uh, there's the beach ball in the middle. And the point is to take the dodgeballs, throw, uh, throw the dodgeballs at the beach ball to make the beach ball go across the line. Um, and it's a good way to get throwing practice and work together as a team. Here's another dodgeball game. And here you can see a hula hut is set up in the foreground. And hula huts are really great because uh, it requires a lot of teamwork. They work together, and one person can't construct that thing. You have to work together, and under pressure, when all these dodgeballs are being thrown, it's hard to keep it up, and it's quite a lot of fun. Uh, we also do baseball, and you can see here we're doing the batting tees. And on the right side, there's a womp bat. Uh, I have a friend, and he was telling me about his nostalgic games that, for him, created that wealth of memory and fun. And uh, he says that when he was a kid, the one thing he remembers from PE is having this bat that kind of looks like that. And when he hits the ball, it makes this good womp. And he was so gleeful when he told me the story. I was like, I got to make one of those. And so I constructed it. And just like his, it makes a nice womp when you hit it. Uh, scooter board games. Um, this game I coined as Scooter Board Quidditch. Uh, you can see here there's a muggle, and he's holding a, a blue snitch. <laughs> and one of the things I learned um, teaching this game and other games is that the best competitive games are the games where the kids can't keep track of the points, <laughs> where um, there's points being scored left and right, and everyone thinks they have uh, 89 points, and the other team doesn't. And at the end, everyone's feeling good, and there's just good feelings from it. Uh, the next game, uh, this is another scooter board game that I personally just loved playing. Uh, it was an odd number of uh, students on a couple classes, so I got to be a teammate. And uh, basically, they take the scooter boards, and you make the limos. They call them limos, with the pool noodles connecting them. 
and then there's the cone. And the point of the game is for um, the person standing and the driver to try to knock the cone off the other uh, limo. And to me, it feels like a, a really fun video game that I've played before, but it's just very high pace, and you have to really work in, together as a team, and it's just, it just gets you going. Here's another scooter board game. Um, this one, the point of the game is to move uh, the scooter board with the jump rope with the bowling pin. And if the bowling pin kind of falls, eh, eh, you're out, but you're not really out. You run and you're basically a bodyguard that guards the bowling pins because they're going through a corridor of students throwing dodgeballs left and right and you're trying to make your way to the very end. And I really like this game because they're working together. Even though you're out, you're not really out and you're kind of working together and to me, it just creates good times and good memories. Uh, also, sometimes it does rain in Albany. And uh, one thing, I actually do like rainy days because I get to teach things that I enjoy. Um, and so uh, what I like to do in a lesson is I usually like to start off with um, my mindfulness meditation. And I sell it hard. I sell it as this will make you a smarter, a better athlete, um, a better friend. And it does because you're focused and you can just pay attention. There's so much benefits when you pay attention. But to me, the, I kind of have a secret agenda. The secret agenda is someday, whether in their high school, college, or maybe later in life, when they're getting stressed, anxious, maybe even depressed, you know, they had that memory of doing mindfulness and they can reach in their back pocket. Hey, I know how to do mindfulness with that kid confidence. And they can, they can just practice it and maybe it'll help them out, hopefully. Um, also, I like to do yoga during rainy days. In this picture, uh, we're the, this is a kindergarten class, and they're practicing juggling. They're juggling. <laughs> um, you can see they're actually holding scarves, and they're holding two scarves, and the scarves go really slow, so these kindergartners are like, oh, and then they're so proud. They're so proud. Uh, and that concludes uh, the spotlight. Uh, questions? Co I don't know if this is, do you do questions and comments at one of these? <laughs> I don't know. I think we just want to say thank you for all of your inventive, creative efforts on the, on the schoolyard. It was a very fun spotlight. Other comments? Thank you very much. Wait, I have one. Yeah, I know I have to get going, but I remember you, you were saying I have a lot of friends who have this fond memory of the parachute. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Yeah, I certainly have those fond memories too, and I'm really glad that you're doing that with them, as well as the, um, we, we called it something different. I, you called it like the huts, the, the Hula huts. Hula huts. Yeah. I remember that game so well, and I just have these like vivid memories of how competitive I was during the castle games, that's what we called it, and just how fun it was, and so I'm just, I'm really glad that there's more Albany students who are having those memories made. Thank you very much. I have a question, oh, wait. actually. Let's do that. Um, <laughs> well, uh, first of all, that was great. Sounds really um, creative. And um, I was wondering, as far as like the equipment levels, and um, you know, it's important to, I mean, especially with all the creative things that you're doing, um, how 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 are the equipment levels for you? Uh, do you feel like you have um, adequate equipment, or actually, yeah, I mean. Um, the PE budget, that's the same in all the elementary schools, it's very good. Um, we basically have $2,000 every year. And even on top of that, there's the, I forget, the AEF fund or something, which often, I've heard from the other PE teachers, they often put in something and they get it. And so from the sentiments I get from the other PE teachers, we're quite happy. So cool. thank you for asking. All right. well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, board, I've had a request from the superintendent that uh, we do make an agenda change, that we move forward our first um, action item, the 12-1 uh, ahead of the consent calendar. That would be the resolution 2019-20-10 African American History Month. Nice. Um, I will make a motion that we make that agenda change. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you very much. Dr. Wells. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. 
Um, tonight we have um, a group of our parents from our African American um, Parent Association here tonight to present us with the African American um, um, resolution for the month of February. At this time I'd like to call up um, Melissa Boyd and Colette West um, to do the presentation um, or anybody else who um, you'd like to go um, with you. In addition to that, we have our, um, everybody knows her, our high school principal, Mrs. Alexia Ritchie. Thank you and good evening. Thank you for having us today. I'd like to do some quick introductions if I could. Alexia Ritchie, the principal of Albany High School, as well as one of the founding members of our Black Parent Advisory Group. Thank you again for having us. We also have Melissa Boyd. She is our current vice president. And we have Colette West, who is our current secretary, along with, I believe her spouse is here, but he's... Um, He's in the audience tonight. So Dr. Wells asked us to um, come and represent the Black Parent Advisory Group as you considered adopting the resolution for the Black History Month here in Albany Unified School District. Um, this is my 27th year in the district. This is the very first time that this has been brought to the board. So we really do appreciate the efforts and the gestures. And what will come next is a concerted effort to make sure that our goals and our purposes are completely supported at every single school in our district. So we do appreciate that. Um, the background, thank you, Dr. Wells, for providing some of the verbiage for the resolution. We've looked it over and we do agree. Um, we want to make sure that we give some time, of course, for questions. But I do believe I'm going to pass it to uh, Melissa Boyd if you'd like us to actually read the resolution. Not quite sure if that's what we should do now. Um, as leaders, we get to make decisions. Exactly. So it's your call. OK, good. Um, we might need a copy of the resolution if we could. Right now, we just have the background. Oh, here we go. Very good. Melissa, would you like to? Oh, sure. Thank you. They have it. Frank? We, we have it, Dr. Wells. Thank it. you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, before reading the resolution, I also just wanted to say, um, just speak personally for a minute about why I think that this is important, or one of the many reasons that I think this is important. When we all as a community are clear on where the treasures that we, that we celebrate, whether it's in literature, mathematics, science, art, athletics, et cetera, when we're clear that we all contributed to those things, then we all know that we belong, that we have a seat at the table. No one is asking to be given anything. No one's asking for a favor. I believe that when we as a community really recognize that we all together built all of the various treasures that we hold dear in our society, all of the learning that we celebrate, when we really do understand that those came from every single part of our community, then the, there's no question about whether or not we all belong, whether or not we should all be, all see ourselves reflected. It's a given because we've all built this thing that we all um, come together to learn about and we're all a part of that. So uh, Black History Month resolution. Whereas Americans of African descent helped develop our nation in countless ways, those recognized, unrecognized, and unrecorded. Whereas African American history reflects a determined spirit of perseverance and cultural pride in its struggle to equally share in the opportunities of a nation founded upon the principles of freedom and liberty for all people one day. Whereas in 1976, Black History Month was established as a month-long celebration to reflect on the history, teachings, and achievements of African Americans. Whereas the history and contributions of African American citizens have consistently been overlooked, misinterpreted, and undervalued in the curriculum of public education institutions prior to the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And whereas the history social science framework for California public schools, kindergarten through grade 12, states that the history curriculum of community, state, region, nation, and world must reflect the experiences of men and women of different racial, religious, and ethnic groups and must be integrated at every level. Now therefore be it resolved that the Albany Unified School District's Board of Trustees proclaims the month of February 2020 as African American History Month and encourages all Albany schools to commemorate this occasion with appropriate instructional activities. Thank you very much, Ms. Boyd. 
Would the board like to uh, vote on this resolution now? May we have a motion? Um, sure. I'd like to make a motion to pass the resolution for uh, 2010, um, 2019, 2020 African American History Month. I second. I'm sorry. No, go okay. for it. You, just, you already did it. You did it so wonderfully. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. The motion passes unanimously. And thank you very much. It's wonderful. Thank you for coming. That was uh, special for us. And it may be the start of a tradition. Thank you. Can I just speak to it for just a second? Um, it was mentioned uh, that it would be a commemoration and hopefully appropriate instructional materials would be a focus of the schools. And I would just like to add that someday, right, the dream, as, as Ms. Boyd mentioned, is that it's, it's it shouldn't be just be a month focus, it's the everyday acknowledgement, and so that someday uh, this will be just everyday stuff, right? We won't have these resolutions, hopefully someday, because it'll be so well integrated, it'll be part of our breadth and the depth of the curriculum. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh, I just wanted to acknowledge um, that the uh, Black Parent Advisory Group um, has been doing uh, this work for a long period of time. Uh, it's not um, something that's just been happening. Um, this has been work that they, that the parents and um, staff have been working on for um, a few years now. Um, and I just wanted to uh, acknowledge and um, kind of uh, point out, uh, you know, all of that that hard work um, that's been going into um, making the um, district more uh, inviting and 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 diverse, and um, celebrating the achievements of uh, everybody. Perfect intro. Pardon me. I do want to plug our Black History Month program coming up on Wednesday, February 12th from 6 to 8 at Albany High School. I believe it's going to be our 6th annual, 5th annual, 6th annual, something like that. Everybody's invited, the entire community. It grows in popularity each year. Last year we had well over 250 attend. So we do invite the entire community to join us for our Black History Month program. Again, that's at Albany High School on Wednesday, February 12th. Oh, you, you. you knew where I was going with that. I did know huh? that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Make a note on my calendar. Yeah. And this, that moves us back to approval of the consent calendar. I think, uh, Dr. Wells. Yeah, ma Madam um, Chair, I would ask that we pull item 8.2, certificated personnel, um, for an introduction of the recommendation for the director of facilities. Certainly, go ahead. Um, at this time, I'd like to take a moment to introduce to, um, um, our final candidate and bring him before you um, for the director of um, facilities. A little something um, about him is that he's been doing this work for the last two decades. Um, we were fortunate to have him rise to the top of some um, highly qualified and skilled um, um, candidates. Um, and his name is um, Benjamin Borrego. Um, this is the opportunity where I have a rare chance to thoroughly embarrass someone. And so uh, before he come here, I thought I'd have him come before you and introduce himself and um, welcome him to our district and, and then um, um, take a vote to um, accept him. So at this time, Mr. Borrego, if you would like to come to the podium. Good evening and welcome. Thank you very much. Um, first, I would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the honor of becoming a member of the Albany Unified School District. Uh, my career is approaching 20 years. Uh, the last seven has been as a director of facilities, operations, and, and transportation. Um, the remainder of my career has been hands-on in facilities maintenance, grounds maintenance, uh, sports turf management, 
custodial services, transportation, both uh, regular and special needs, and construction management. So I look forward to working for the Board of Trustees, the superintendent, administration, site administrators, um, certificated staff, classified staff, students in the community. Um, and I especially look forward to meeting my staff and, and working with them. And the first thing I want to let you know is I am a team player and that's what I'm going to promote in the department. I just have to add, and he didn't um, mention it, but um, we had a chance to do a thorough investigation um, and ask people about him and what came back consistently is that he's a people person and very responsive to their needs and they love him. And the superintendent is hating me right now because we stole him. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I was lucky enough to be a part of the final interviews for um, this position. And I was so impressed with your history and your dedication. And I think that you'll find some new challenges here in Albany that, that I think will energize and excite you. We've got a, a building program going on. We're doing some um, interesting things in terms of uh, our indoor air quality. You know, um, so I look forward to seeing you as a part of our district staff. Thank you. I think that we should, um, I think we should move it back onto the consent calendar and then vote on the consent calendar as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Borrega. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Doss, did you want to mention the uh, the typo in the backup on um, that consent calendar item? The um, we noted it and made the no. correction. Okay. Oh, okay. So it's been noted and the correction has been made, but it basically read that it was, um, we were um, paying $28,000 for a dance program. And so I just saw that as a typo. It was, it was supposed to be uh, 2800 So we fixed it. That's right. There's just an extra zero in there. Good catch, man. <laughs> Excellent catch. That was going to be one heck of a dance program, let me tell you. <laughs> okay. And uh, with that, can I get a motion to approve the consent calendar? I make a, oh, sorry. Go for it. Oh, boy. Look who's doing it now. Whoa. Okay. Um, I move that we approve the consent calendar. I'm scared to say. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Welcome aboard, Mr. Richard. And that then brings us to our reports. Uh, Dr. Wells, would you like to start with the superintendent report? Yes. Um, I'm excited about some of our um, construction projects that are going on around the district and um, being in a position to watch um, a number of our uh, multiple projects come in on time and so far under budget. We're hoping to continue with that streak. Um, later today, you will get to see some pictures of, of our um, construction projects. Um, I've also um, spent time spending um, time in schools and with our staff and more specifically our teachers. And I'm just um, always consistently um, pleased with the kind of effort and above, above and beyond the duty um, that not just our teachers, but our classified employees um, do on a regular basis to make this school function. Um, many of them don't see this as a job, but they see this as their mission. And it's just a wonderful joy to be um, a leader of a ship that has that as part of their culture. And so I just wanted to remind folks of um, what Albany is all about. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have no report tonight. I'll pass on to Vice President Jerome. Uh, no report tonight. Nope. Oh, um, I just uh, had a, um, one 
thing that I wanted to mention. Um, I know that we might have a lot of community members um, that work uh, remotely, and so I wanted to mention that my um, a good friend of mine is uh, opening up a, a co-work space, um, Pilar Co-work. Um, it's located uh, here in, in the Bay Area. It allows you to be able to uh, work, but also you can bring your children, which is really um, exciting. And um, I know that um, sometimes trying to find places where you can work and take your kids during the, all the different uh, breaks uh, during school might be tough. So it, uh, it is open during all the breaks uh, that Albany um, has in place. So again, that's uh, PillarCowork.com. Uh, I, don't, I hope I'm not, sorry, are you finished? I am all done. Uh, I hope I'm not preempting one of the student items, but on Thursday this week at 6.30, oh, yes. you are? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> not, uh, I'm just very excited about that meeting. So I will say a corollary to that is that I've seen the three portables that the fifth graders will be in at the high school, which is very exciting. So it's, we're very close to moving Ocean View. Um, with mixed feelings, but I will not spoil the other event. I have no other report. Student board members, would you like to proceed with your report? Yeah, okay, so um, high schoolers have finals next week, and traditionally we've had dead week, um, the week before finals, but this week we're replacing it with wellness week. Um, <laughs> so this has been organized by the teachers, so there's going to be a therapy dog on Thursday and a therapy bunny. Um, Stressful making, healthy snacks and tea stations, relaxing music over the loudspeaker, a tentative Zumba class, um, and other activities that the teachers have organized. So it's really great that they're able to do this for us. Um, the, win the winter dance show will be held this Thursday and Friday at the Little Theater. Um, and I think there's three different show times. At Albany Middle School, the Science Olympiad Club participated in the Mira, Lo Mira Loma Invitational this past weekend. And the Speak Up, Be Safe Parent Education Night will be held at 5 p.m. on January, that should say 31st, I think, at the AMS library. All right. At Marin Elementary School, um, the Adams Family will be shown at the Marin Movie Night on the 24th. The 100th on fundraiser has started with a goal of 13,000 this year. Thank you to the Marin PTA for your hard work with the fundraiser. At Cornell, community time will be at the playground tomorrow, Wednesday morning, the 15th. And Abominable, which is a movie, will be shown on January 17th at the Cornell Multipurpose Room. At Ocean View, the <laughs> bit of information that Sarah was so excited to share, um, there is an information night at Ocean, or about Ocean View's move to the middle school. That will be this Thursday, January 16th. And there's also a PTA fundraiser with Mod Pizza on January 23rd, where a portion of profits, um, if you mention AHS, will, excuse me, Ocean View, will be going to the elementary school. For all elementary schools, uh, Speak Up, Be Safe Parent Education Night will be on the 26th at the Albany Middle School Library. And as we're gonna talk about later in this meeting, the California School Dashboard is up for this school year. And then finally, as a part of the policy proposal section, leadership students are a great uh, resource for student input in addition to me and Audrey, the student board reps. We are really looking, leadership is really looking to get more involved with the committees and the boards that make our schools great, including the school board. And me and Audrey wanna create a stronger connection between board members and leadership students. Um, leadership. Students represent all grades and a variety of student groups. Leadership members can also help disseminate information if the board is trying to get information out to students. And me and Audrey are gonna be working with all of you guys to create a stronger bond between leadership students and the board. And that's it for our, for our report. Uh, thank you, and thank leadership for uh, extending that offer. I think we'll be sure to take them up on that. Uh, look forward to working more with high school students on our committees. Thank you. I'm jealous of all that stuff they got going at the high school now, because I remember when I was at Albany High, we did not have all of that. Oh, rabbits. We did not have therapy rabbits. <laughs> 
Did you have that there for a We are up to item 11, persons to address the board on matters not on the agenda. Director Michael. Good evening, board. I wanted to take a second to introduce this lovely lady here manning the um, computer this evening. This is Tara Burton. She's the new special ed secretary for Albany Unified School District. So she now sits in the office adjacent to mine. So I just wanted to make her um, known and so you can put a name to a face. Um, so this is Tara Burton. So we welcome her. And I also wanted to um, remind folks that on January 22nd, 2020 at 7 p.m. in the Cornell Multipurpose Room, we will be having the TKK Parent Orientation Night. So the sites have posted flyers, sent home invitations. I've also had um, asked for it to be put on the district website. So um, everyone's welcome to attend. Thank you. Thank you, Director Michael. Now we've already done um, item 12-1. This brings us to 12-2, another resolution, uh, resolution 2019-20-11, tie-breaking criteria for certificated employees. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, Marina Gonzalez, personnel coordinator. Uh, so this resolution um, is passed regularly in the event that um, the district has a need to reduce staff, specifically certificated staff. And um, when we make reductions, those are based on seniority. So in the event that there is a tie in terms of seniority, so specific position is, or kind of position is being reduced. Um, and there are two people who rendered service on the exact same day as their first day of employment. Um, the point system that we would use to determine who would be the least senior. Thank you for that explanation. Do we have any questions from the board? Yes. Um, I'm just getting it up here real quick, or if it's up, can you go to the um, actual point ranking? It's in the resolution, actually, so maybe it's a different link, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. So the, um, the first bullet that's filled in that says credentialing, mm -hmm. then it says one point per credential, preliminary or clear. I just want to make sure I'm reading that correctly because um, if they're both hired on the same day, somebody who has a clear credential is deemed the same as somebody who has a preliminary credential as far as points because that doesn't seem... Um, yes, but also I, this bullet point refers to folks who might have multiple credentials. So if we were reducing, let's say, a service in... Um, multiple subject, uh, and we had two folks who were tied for seniority. Um, there may be one, fo one person who has an additional credential, maybe they've pursued a single subject in, um, what's not up there, PE, uh, and they're still working on that particular credential, um, so. Yeah, I get it with the additional credentials, but you have student A, sorry, teacher A and teacher B, for example, mm -hmm. both hired on the same day. Mm -hmm. I would think that the person who had a clear credential should be above them. Mm. The way I'm reading this, if in that particular scenario, if you have teacher A and teacher B, mm -hmm. it goes to a coin toss. And I would think that a clear credential, in my own personal opinion, should be way more heavily than a preliminary credential. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. That's something we can discuss in the future. Well, we're, this is review and action, right? Well, we've, this is identical to what we passed last year. And so um, 
we were just going with what has already been established. Okay, well, I'll rephrase that then. I would suggest that a clear credential has a higher ranking than a preliminary credential. I don't know if I need to ask for anybody to second it or so jump in, Frank, or? It's something we can certainly consider because in rank and file, the clear credential does outrank the preliminary credential. Right. So then would it be, would you get like uh, one point for um, clear and then like a half a point for preliminary? It depends. How we want to reword it. Or if it, it seems like um, because I think that the district does need this done right away so that we should uh, make whatever change is necessary. Um, so is, is that, uh, would you like to make the motion that, we, that the wording is changed to one point for a clear credential and a half a point for a preliminary? Whatever's the cleanest for you, I just like the example I gave. Sure, you're, so down, you're, you're, you're down to two people left, and it's teacher A and B. However, we need to word it that so if everything is the same except for the clear and the preliminary. So would we add another bullet in between that said one point for each clear credential and a half a point for each preliminary if credential? That's what the majority of the board agrees with. Whatever makes it easier for you. I'm just give you I Sure. I was in a situation many years ago <laughs> and I got pink slipped and a person at my site didn't. Mm -hmm. But he had two credentials. Mm -hmm. So it was very clear cut to me. So I wouldn't so, want a situation where it comes down to a coin toss because if I was the person who had the clear credential and I lost on a coin toss to somebody who doesn't have a clear credential, I think that could cause serious problems. Sure. So however the wording, I don't, I, I'm not. Can I make a recommendation um, just to keep it simple? Um, simplicity ought to be our best policy. Perhaps um, if we can delineate Get directions to delineate, um, for example, as one point per credential preliminary and maybe 1.5 for clear. And I think that would be an easy okay. fix. Sure. Okay, I just, I need a motion from the board that states that. Um, yeah. Somebody else might have. Fine question. Sure. Was, is this, when it was, a, if we, we've been passing the same thing repeatedly, was it originally formulated with discussions with the teachers, or is no. this just something the district? It's something the with? district develops. Okay. I make a motion that uh, one point be awarded for clear and point five be awarded for preliminary. I'll second that. All in favor? There's a motion on the report. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? No, the, but I have a, question, a follow up question. A follow up question, go ahead. So the second bullet also gives the same credit for preliminary or clear credentialing. Oh, very good point. Yeah, but those are state hard to fill positions, and that's the rationale for giving it more points because those are almost impossible to find. Um, and so, consistently with what folks are doing throughout California, they give that more points because it's a no, great need. I get why the second bullet exists, but okay. it's the same issue that Jacob raised before, where they'll get two points for a preliminary math credential and two points for a clear. Got it, you're right. We're, we're doing it for all of them, right? Well, there's two of them that says preliminary and clear. So yeah, I thank you, sir, for catching that. So do it I could still be an Yes, maybe we need to add. I believe two and two and a half or something. I, I, yeah, I, th I think that the way that the the motion was phrased oh, allows only both the um, first and second bullet to be adjusted that way because it just said for preliminary or clear. Um, I mean, I can re I can say it again and and make and include both. That's that's fine. Just to keep it clean. Yeah, but because there are, uh, because the second bullet point has different points, yeah. you'll have to one and two or one. So two. I make a motion to for uh, credentials to receive uh, the f full point value, and for the preliminary to receive 
um, half of that value based on where it falls in the point system. For example, 1.4 per credential and 0.5 for preliminary and two points for the second bullet and half of that for preliminary. One point. It should be one point. Okay. Right. I second that. Let's vote again just to well, make sure that we've. It was clear to me what he was saying. One more time. Will we keeping the values the same but kind of delineate it like we did the first one? Or are you reducing the value? The value, the value, the value, the value is the same. Okay. But if it's if it's clear, you, it's the full point system. If it's preliminary, it's half of whatever that point is. So for a preliminary credential in special ed, science, or math, you would get one point. Right. Okay. okay. The motion has passed. I have a follow-on question too. Um, uh, Ms. Gonzalez, how often is this used? How frequently are there two people uh, that are started service on the same day and that we have to bring forward a tie-breaking criteria? Um, we, I, we haven't had to enact this point system for as long as I can remember. I can just add to it, from, from my experience, I mean, San Leandro is a bigger district, but you lay off folks who are the newest hired. Mm -hmm. So when you do start sending out ping slips, it's going to happen. It does happen? Okay. Yeah, usually it's your first and second year teachers. You know, so if you're laying off 15 teachers and you have 20 new teachers, <laughs> unfortunately those 15 that get the ping slips are all going to have been hired pretty much at the same time. I think um, uh, Vice President Doss bring, uh, Duran brings forward um, the point that um, she feels that we haven't voted on the motion as it was clearly stated. Well, he re uh, so Brian repeated it, clear, clarified it, and I think now we need to vote on that. Mm -hmm. Vice President Duran would like to uh, just vote again to make sure you know, after we've had the clarification just to make sure that uh, we've dotted our I's and crossed our T's. So I will ask for another vote uh, on this resolution 2019-20-11 as clarified in the motion by Trustee Doss. All in favor? Aye. Aye. It passes unanimously with the change so described. That brings us to independent contractor service agreement with Nancy Welt, education specialist. Good evening again. This um, independent contractor services agreement between Albany Unified School District and Nancy Welt um, has come about due to the increased number of initial assessments and triennial assessments. We had um, difficulty finding an RSP teacher for Cornell at the beginning of the year. We now have um, a teacher there. We have a returning um, teacher coming back uh, the beginning of February, but our substitute was not, um, we felt it would be better to have someone with experience giving these assessments. So we have contracted with a retired education specialist who will be available on call should we need extra help to complete assessments so we can meet deadlines. Thank you for that explanation. Do we have any questions or comments from the board? Yes, Mr. President. Um, I move. I move that we approve the, this independent contractor service agreement between Albany Unified School District and Nancy Welt, for, uh, educational specialist. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. This approved unanimously. And that brings us to our next contract. Master contract between Albany Unified and Center for Early Intervi Intervention on Deafness. 
I bring forward tonight a master contract for the Center uh, for Early Intervention on Deafness, which is referred to as SEED in as jargon in the, in the special ed community. We have contracted with SEED because we have a preschooler, an Albany preschooler who is deaf, um, who will be needing these services to attend preschool. So um, this center comes very highly regarded um, and is um, very close to Albany, so the parents are easily able to get their child to this program. So the master contract is attached, and I'm asking that you approve this master contract for our little girl who needs these services. Um, she'll be there four days a week, five days a week, excuse me, for three hours a day. Um, the speech and language um, instruction will be embedded in her day as per the question for the um, question and answers. And we do not have this program available right now in our school district, so that um, is the impetus for the contract. Questions, comments? I'm, I'm curious how many students we have, and I'm not sure if you can answer this like due to privacy issues, but I'm curious if you are able to answer how many students we have that um, like need to be placed outside of the district. I can get that information. We do have students that are in non-public schools um, throughout grades K through um, 12. Uh, it's not something I have readily available in my memory bank, but it is something I can pull very easily. Okay. So. May I have a motion? I'll move that we approve the master contract between AUSD and the Center for Early Intervention on Deafness. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Thank you. Now we have the independent contractor agreement with Hazmat Doc for abatement management at the Ocean View Rebuild. Thank you, President Trutain. Um, prior to demolition of the existing ex um, structure at Ocean View Elementary School, all hazardous materials must be abated. And the project expected time is um, January through March 2020. So construction company can start the construction work right, af right after March. Um, and the amount of this agreement is 33,255 in bond fund. That was a killer obvious. And we are here this evening for the board to approve the independent contract agreement with HazMed DOT. Okay, questions or comments on this contract? Um, I did send in a question and it's hopefully the rest of the board saw the question which had to do with a policy that uh, we might want to have since we found out there is not at the current at this moment, a written policy um, regarding subcontractors that have a focus on being sure that they're looking for uh, minority contractors, which minority means a whole lot of definitions, and including women and uh, veterans and people of color, et cetera. And so it's not part of this specific, but whether we can entertain the idea of either having um, the superintendent work on a written policy if the board so chooses. And, but uh, also a question, it, it doesn't really impact on finances, right, in a way? Uh, when you look at two contractors, could it sometimes have a, um, would there be a, a competition or would it increase prices for some companies as opposed to others? Right, I believe this can be one of the, um, um, priorities when we have two maybe vendors at the same uh, condition. Mm -hmm. So this is certainly an item that we can discuss. Thank you. And um, so oh, go ahead. Yeah, I agree with Clementina. Um, I thought this question came up before. Um, I'm just looking at the contract. I don't see it. I know we have a discrimination clause but I thought we did have something about that before. If we don't have, I agree with Clementina, we should definitely discuss making a policy. Um, did somebody look into this when they answered their question? You couldn't find anything that was already on the books? Because I thought this came up, do you remember that, Kim? Yeah, I, I generally check all of them for the non-discrimination. It's item 19 
Yeah, no, I just use as, yeah, I use that as an example, but I thought that we did have something maybe in certain standard contracts where we do specify what Clementina's talking about or I could be misunderstood. I'm, I'm just trying to say if we already have something, at least we have somewhere to start. But if you've looked into it and we don't, then I think we should. Um, I think that um, CBO Kim brought that forward as a tie-breaking criteria. Mm -hmm. uh, if we have contracts that are coming in at the same bid, I think that this is something that we can look into a little bit more uh, going forward this spring, just to see what we do have on the books and, and how we might need to augment that. Um, for this particular contract, uh, I know that it mentions asbestos, which is um, a, of great concern, certainly. Uh, and I asked the question about uh, the presence of asbestos at Ocean View. And I, th I think there was a, a small amount detected. Uh, and I think that what we're talking about doing here is, uh, you know, is checking daily to make sure that none is getting released in the air so that we can uh, have a safe working environment for the demolition team. So I'm glad that the district is being very serious about maintaining a safe workspace uh, for, for everyone involved. So. And with that, I will make a motion that we approve the independent contractor agreement with Hazmat Dock for abatement management at Ocean View Rebuild Project. A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. <coughs> the motion passes unanimously. And we have another contract, agreement to amend um, our contract with Nino and more for geotechnical materials testing and special testing services for Albany High School Edition project. CBO Kim, can you? Sure. Thank you, um, President Retain. This item, um, so previously the board approved an agreement with Nino and more to provide a special testing services for Albany High School Edition project. And this is an amendment for the additional cost for out-of-state um, travel to provide inspection of the glued laminated beam fabrications according to the DSA requirement. And this is additional cost of $6,577 in bond funds. Um, and this, we are here this evening to approve the amendment with the um, Nino and more. Now, um, it's mentioned here in the backup that this travel had to already happen. And so that, you know, uh, brings forward um, the issue of how quickly the district is moving to finish up the uh, Albany High School Edition project. Would, would you be able to comment on that? Because, I mean, I know our standard procedure is that the board approves, uh, you know, in advance, but there were some uh, extenuating circumstances here. Would you like to go into that? Sure. So certain items, I know I'm going to um, discuss another item, the next item as well. So certain items when they are on a testing uh, with their uh, staff. Um, we do not have um, enough time for the board approval for another two weeks. So things happen at the site. So this is one of the items, and the next item will be as well. And I will explain more into that in the next items. Okay. okay. And, and I also like to add um, that we are at the final stage of um, Albany High School Edition project, and Artin was authorized to proceed for the construction on February 24th, 2019, and they'll expect to finish the um, project on February 1st, 2020. So in two weeks, we'll have a brand new building. Yay. Yes. Yay. The Ocean View students first for them to move in. And this is about... I'm sorry, I just have to say, under cost and before, um, and, and completing early. And so this is really big. On budget, yes. <laughs> and this is about 11 month construction with about 13 days of no work with the rain during the construction period. So this project is very successful and because of the um, 
or the teamwork between the district, DCA, and art and construction, and their subcurrent contractors, and also CSA inspections. And um, so this is just um, really a success for the district. And we had an initial walkthrough last week, and I have some pictures that I like to share. So here is the brand new building we have. Eight classrooms and maker's room. And another side. So it's a beautiful building with lots of windows and very bright, a lot of sunlight. I'm sorry, I must add that we're having the ribbon cutting ceremony Saturday, February 8th at 1.30 p.m. Um, notifications to go out this week, but I thought I'd put that plug in there so that folks would know. Great, thank you. I look forward to cutting the ribbon on another new building. I want to point out to Mr. Borrega here, this is a very high standard that uh, we hope that you can uphold. We're uh, on time and at or under budget for our first two construction projects out of four projects on this uh, bonds program. So I hope you can keep that streak going as we move forward to rebuilding the elementary schools. In, in, in terms of this um, item, I had kind of wanted to revisit and, and in, in the sense that if some, if the board wants to reconsider once again, we've had discussions about giving the superintendent authorization and we never quite were able to accomplish that uh, in terms of money where he could, you know, go ahead without, without prior board approval. And this kind of raises the issue once again. Obviously, when we're talking about um, construction and time being, you know, the most precious element, then of course this, this happened. Uh, but, but just in general, if the board ever wants to reconsider us uh, having a renewed discussion about giving the superintendent some lat uh, latitude uh, some, so that he could go ahead and make some decisions financially without having to come to us first. That is noted. Um, Board Member Clark? Yeah. Um, the way I'm seeing it, this is a perfect example of how the business still gets done without giving them the extra authority. He didn't come to us before. He came to us after when we had this discussion last time. Whenever these instances come up, it's been past practice that you guys do what you need to do. We can still have a further discussion about a threshold on the limit, but I had stated that last time. The way we're currently doing things doesn't stop staff from doing what they need to do. And I might add, it puts um, me in a heck of a dilemma. I'm charged with the responsibility of coming up at budget or under budget and on time. And so um, I have to make the best call um, looking at what's in the best interest of the district, but also being transparent that this is what we did. Understood. Thank you. Board Member Clark? Yeah, just one quick one. I wanted to make sure I heard that correctly, that this project was done not just on time, but early and under budget. All right, thank you very much. It's actually something I ran on. <laughs> and I realized as one board member, you can't do much. <laughs> so you guys made it happen. And I want to thank all of you guys because it's very important for me that we deliver on what we promise, especially when we ask people to pass bonds and parcels. So good job. Thank you, May I get a motion to approve the Nino and Moore contract? I move that we approve the Nino and Moore contract. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion passes unanimously. And now we have the amendment to lease agreement from, uh, with mobile modular for three portable classrooms at Albany High. Thank you, President Trutain. So previously, the board approved the lease agreement with Mobile Modular to install and lease three portable classrooms at Albany High School for Ocean View students for temporary housing. And this item is amendment for additional labor work required to call through the existing 
thickened concrete slab <laughs> to anchor, to enable to anchor in the three portable classrooms according to DSA requirement. So what happened was those um, area we put three portables it used to be a fire lane. So the concrete is thicker than other um, regular laptop. So then now the extra work has to be done. And this is also, the work is already completed because um, when they were digging in, they realized, oh, this is a, about three inch thick in than the other regular concrete. So um, this work has been done and it is about $1,755 in bond fund. And I also have some um, pictures I'd like to share. So here is three portables. And I just found that there is a tiny of little bit this new high school buildings there, the addition that we just saw earlier. Um, and when you want to look at more close look, this is how it looks. So it's all there now. I do have one question. Um, for the, I mean, I understand what happened and you know why, but um, I'm assuming that there's a lot of um, pre-work that goes into dropping the portable. So I'm just wondering, um, was there like a split cost on that? As far as um, we probably should have known this before we brought these three portables here to do this work. So since we dropped the ball on this, it, it's supposed to cost 3600 but since we, or was it just we found something else, so right. you guys got to pay for it? Right. Usually in the construction area, we did not realize. So earlier the item also, um, the beam, usually what I understand is, and what I have learned is that um, usually in Bay Area, those beams are um, fabricated in Tracy. But our construction company found out the, uh, for them the best contractors, and they were fabricated in Oregon. So that's why there was additional cost. And also, again, for this project, we didn't realize that the concrete is thicker due to the fire lane. Um, so those are the additional costs that we did not anticipate. Right. Oh, because we use, oh, because, because it was Oregon and they have like different regulations than California? No, then, then they had to travel to Oregon to look at the fabrication. Oh, they had to travel right. there. Uh -huh. So that was the earlier item. And this item is because this portable is standing on fire lane, that concrete is thicker than the regular um, concrete. I mean, that makes sense. It just sounds like they should have had to pay for it and not us. That's all. Right. So it's just an unexpected I like item. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not a lot of money, but at the same time, mm -hmm. It sounds like it, was, it sounds like they dropped the ball and, and not us, but it's fine. I feel better now that I mentioned it. <laughs> Miss Kim, I have a question. Just um, at looking at the portables here, um, are these uh, wheelchair accessible? Because these two are not at the moment. They will be. They will be. Yes. Thank you. May I have a motion to approve the $1,700 amendment for the mobile modular contract? I move to approve the amendment to the lease agreement with mobile modular. I second that. All in favor? Aye. 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 And now the independent contractor agreement with CAS inspections to be inspector of record for the Ocean View rebuild. Okay. Um, CIS has been the inspector at um, Annex and also at um, AHS Addition Project. And um, this company will um, ensure the buildings um, meet all the state <coughs> requirements and this um, provide um, official oversight for the state. Um, and we ask the board this evening to approve the independent contract agreement with CIS, CIS Inspections Inc. And it's, it is amount of um, three, 387200 in bond fund. Go ahead, questions or comments on this contract? Member Clark? Somebody had asked a question about this in the, um, 
questions we send to staff. So I don't know if somebody else want to, I don't want to like jump in. I don't know who sent it. <clears throat> yes. Did you want to address it? Because I, I'm sure it's the standard fee, but 18 months at $316,000 is a really nice job. Is that just the standard rate? Because I busted out the calculator like Clementina did, and it just seems an awful lot of money. Right. So I checked in with our project management company, and this is a competitive price for us. And um, he also makes sure that this price um, is really the standard price for other business in this area. Because just doing quick math, 18 months, and it's 316000 for 18 months. That's like $210,000 a year. So I think I need to look for another job. But just, it's not all one person's salary. It's also a lot of equipment and paperwork and materials and... Right, that is correct. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the standard rate. That's what it is. Thank you. Board, would you like to move this contract? I move that we approve this independent contract agreement with CAS Inspections, Inc. for Inspector of Record Services for the Ocean View re Rebuild Project. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The contract passes unanimously. And that is the end of our review and action. We move to review and discussion with our enrollment update. <coughs> Dr. Wells, who would like to take this item? Our enrollment update will be coming um, momentarily as um, you're seeing Mrs. Michaels um, doing a number of duties tonight, this being one of them. Good evening, Board of Education. This is now Director Michael of Student Services. Um, reporting on the revision to board policy 5117. Um, it was recommended by the Board of Education that we add a priority for grandchildren of Albany residents, which I added in your um, packet you see on the draft copy. It becomes priority three. I have written it in red. The priority just states that students who are grandchildren of individuals who live within the boundaries of Albany Unified School District have a priority for enrollment. In the backup, there are some stipulations that talk about um, what is required to present, proof of residency, proof of identification, along with certi certified proof of child's relationship to the Albany resident. If the grandparent moves from the property to a resident outside, residence, excuse me, outside of Albany, grandchildren attending Albany Unified School District will no longer be eligible to continue enrollment in AUSD. And I know that that was a question that presented as problematic, which um, since this is a review and discussion item, we can certainly entertain how this would be written in a way that's more conducive to providing continuity for student attendance um, and all the other issues that making a child disenroll because their grandparent moves um, make it non-problematic. So I just wanted to present the draft to you and then um, I'm really not sure how to proceed with the revisions. Um, I don't know that we do them right now, but. I think the board will need to discuss this. There were a okay. few items that came up in board questions. One, um, uh, whether the board would like this to be third priority or a different priority in the stack list. Mm -hmm. um, also that question that you just mentioned about you know, if the grandparent does move out of district, uh, do we preserve edu educational continuity for the grandchildren? Um, and there was a typo which was corrected yeah, as well. Yeah, the typo was corrected. So I open up discussion for the board. Go ahead, board member Hanley. I guess I have a broader question related to the language in the backup, which is any student is eligible to apply for an interdistrict transfer permit. Once they get that permit, we 
try to maintain their continuity unless there's some reason that we need to discontinue the permit until they're in 12th grade. Right. Right. So I guess I'm a little confused at how the priority list interacts. The priority list helps them get a permit. Once they have the permit, they're all treated like any student an Albany with student, an inter-district right. transfer permit. So even if the criteria that gave them priority is no, no longer true, I don't see why that affects them holding the permit. Do you see what, am I confusing two different things? So it doesn't matter if their parent stops working for the district or their parent stops working for the city or their grandparent moves out or their sibling graduates. Once they have the permit, they have the permit. It doesn't matter if their priority changes. I, I, I agree. Before I became a board member, um, I attended some board discussions prior to that about inter-district transfers. And it has been the board's um, a priority for some time to preserve continuity for the student. Right. Um, and so that is certainly something that uh, the board could change, you know, uh, or we could reiterate our support of the continuity. I mean, for example, if somebody applies and they get their move to the top of the priority because their parent works at AUSD. They're in second grade. Here they are in 10th grade and their parent, do we keep asking them every year, does your parent work for AUSD? No. So it seems like we should not have any language that implies once they lose that priority status that their permit is somehow in jeopardy. How does the policy read at this moment? Does anybody have a, a copy that we could look at? Because we may be. It's what's in the. It's what's in the backup. It's the, what's the in the backup. Policy. The policy doesn't have the language about the grandparent moving. It's just the backup. So it's not in the actual draft of the BP. So the BP just simply states, or what I've done is I've added a, a priority grandchildren as a priority for priority three. And where I got number three was from the issues bin. It said second or third, so I just plopped right. it into third. So the, the policy says the board believes in educational continuity and feels that an inter-district transfer student once admitted should not be exited except for violation of their contract or under extraordinary circumstances. It makes no reference to the priority status that they may have, that may have helped them get the permit. I think also we should make this like more clear or as clear as we can because if we're asking for inter-district transfers, it would seem unclear if we're talking about disenrollment measures. Right. Yep. I have one other issue. If you look at the um, <coughs> above the priority list, uh, if we can move to the, to the actual BP. Yeah, that one. Thank you, Tara. Thank you. Um, okay, in the, in the first paragraph, it says, the District Board of Education believes that children should attend schools where they live. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think that we're moving away from that as a board. Mm -hmm. I think that we're uh, encouraging students from other districts to come here to Albany. So um, my suggestion would be that we, that we remove that sentence, because uh, I don't think it reflects the current feeling of the board. Then we would also change the sentence after that, because it says, shall consider, and then with this general principle. Oh, good catch. We need to say, um, so maybe the whole paragraph be stricken? Because also we don't, it, shall consider doesn't sound like it's open. Well, I would even one up that and say that probably that whole paragraph would need to be reworked because each sentence kind of brings you to the next one. So we might just have to rework it. Obviously, you can't change the California state law, but just making it sound better. Do we have to state the California state law portion on here? Because all this entire paragraph seems like it's very, mm -hmm. like, right. pushing away 
people. Sounds kind of restrictive, doesn't it? Yeah. 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 I mean, I don't. Do, do we have an obligation to state the California state law? No. I don't think so. Usually, the language for board policies are pulled from gamut, so that there's a really it's consistent throughout the state. So it's not. It might be suggested language. I don't know, Miss Williams. You want to? Is there something? Yeah, uh, this could be something too that we could bring up in our board policy committee as well, and and have more more time and more minds to focus on it. Um, yeah, I would I would normally be very supportive of that, but I think that we're entering into the season where we're recruiting mm -hmm. uh, interdistrict transfer students, and so because of the urgency, you know, right now, I, I I think it sort of behooves the board to figure out what we want for this. And uh, you know maybe board policy committee can come back you know later and clean up you know clean up wording if necessary. But but we need kind of need to get our intentions stated so that the district can move forward. Well, in, in the interest of time, I mean this is the board policy, and, and we are the board. Feels weird saying that sometimes. Um, I like how the, if we could just take out that first paragraph and then just start with the board recognizes that students who reside in one school district may wish to attend school in another school district and that such choices are made for a variety of reasons. So just take that out, move it up. And then you had mentioned about the priority number so I, I don't know if the board wishes to. The, sure, I, I the priority number right now is stating that it would be number three, which bumps siblings to number four. Um, it's, it just doesn't, it doesn't seem right to bring in, to move those students to number three, but then that would bump a brother and sister would have to go to school in separate yeah. districts. Yeah, I, have the, I was thinking about the exact same thing. I think if we're interested in, in educational continuity, it's like, Having two siblings go to the same school district serves that purpose far more than having a new, bringing a new student and a new family into the Albany school district because a grandparent lives there. Right, because then also uh, one of the rules of the interdistrict transfer, uh, you can't miss a certain amount of days, right? So asking a family that you can't miss a certain amount of days, but then telling them that they have, if they have two kids, they have to go to school in different um, districts um, doesn't really seem fair so I would move that we make this priority number four uh, and not bump the siblings priority. Uh, any, uh, any other comments on that? Is the board comfortable with that? Yeah I certainly am. I think that we should approve this but with the amendments that we switch the third and fourth, probably what? It's review and discussion. Oh, huh. yeah. Well, when we do end up voting on it, I think that it seems like we would want to strike the first paragraph mm -hmm. and then also switch the third and fourth priorities. OK, and then I think that the information about um, that was in the backup, uh, where, it, where it mentioned if the grandparents move out, then the kids are going to have to stop coming here. I, I, that I, I believe is a uh, is not the will of the board, and I also think that that kind of detail would uh, probably go into the administrative regulation uh, associated with this BP. Right. All right. I think direction has been. Uh, been given, okay. Duly noted. noted. So st st strike the first paragraph and switch uh, three and four. Right. Okay. And, and at some point it would, it would be really lovely to see uh, an updated AR. I think there's a lot of things that are changing about our inter-district transfer um, process. And I know that the AR is the district's um, process and documentation, but I, I think it would be nice if that could be shared with the board so that we could all understand just the way the whole process works. Okay. Uh, it would be great to see that. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you.
We have moved on to staff reports. Item 14-1, elementary pilot breakfast program update. Good evening to the board. We meet again. I'm here to present to you an update on the pilot breakfast program. We have the slideshow. Yeah, there we go. Great. Thank you. Okay. You know who I am. Sabina Feinberg, executive chef. And let's see. Scroll down. Oops, sorry. <laughs> okay, sorry. So we launched the breakfast program on September 2nd at all the elementary schools. The following data is taken from September 2nd to the end of November, November 29th, which is 59 school days. We've served a total of 2,572 breakfasts during that time, which averages out to about 43 breakfasts per day. Originally, we were talking about serving just cold items, but I was able to make it work and we provide heated food. We have a one week cycle menu. So we have a different entree item each day for a week and then the cycle repeats. And in addition to the main item every day, we also offer cereal or cereal bar um, or a muffin every day. And that comes with fruit, juice, and milk. <coughs> Next slide. Thank you. So this graph shows the daily participation by site. Um, this is calculated over that 59 days. So at Marin, Marin has the highest participation, about 20 per day. The um, Ocean View plus the Annex is about 15 per day, and Cornell is at about nine per day. Next slide. This graph shows participants by eligibility. Um, approximately 54% of the kids who get breakfast qualify for free or reduced lunch, but interestingly, only 5% of all of the free and reduced elementary students in the district are taking advantage of the breakfast service on a daily basis. So this is about 19 free or reduced kids out of 351 who qualify for free or reduced lunch at the elementary level, which is not uncommon from what I hear in other districts. Uh, this chart, thank you. Uh, this chart breaks down how the reimbursement works. So we receive a state and federal reimbursement for each breakfast served. So for each breakfast we serve to a student that's eligible for free meals, we receive $2.08. For each breakfast we serve to a student that's eligible for a reduced price meal, we receive $1.78, and the parent pays 30%, I mean 30 cents, which uh, is a total of $2.08, and then for the paid students, we receive 31 cents reimbursement, and the parent pays $2, so we receive a total of $2.31. The meal, as I said, consists of the entree, milk, fruit, and juice, and the food cost per meal averages out to about $1.25 per meal. So our average income after the food cost is 94 cents per meal. Okay, um, so the labor costs. Uh, the on-site labor, which is the staff person that comes, prepares the food, serves, operates the POS, and cleans up, takes an hour. Um, it's approximately $13 an hour for each staff person, and there's four sites. Then at the central kitchen, um, we factored in the cost of support labor for the breakfast service there. Um, the elementary manager um, orders and prepares the food for transport. It takes about three hours per week, and then we have to transport the food to the sites. So our total labor comes out to $70 per day, and we've included 30% of, of the taxes and benefits, so it comes out to $91 a day. So my average income is $41 per day. 
but my labor is 91, which means the cafeteria fund is contributing about $50 a day for the breakfast program. So the total cafeteria fund contribution from that period in September to November was $2,951. And projected for the entire school year is just over $9,000, slightly less than we had originally projected. So in order to break even, we'd have to serve 97 breakfasts a day, which averages to about 32, 33 breakfasts per day among three sites. So in all of this, Ocean View and the annex is combined, because all of the data is combined, even though they're different sites. So there have been some challenges. Um, finding a staff person for one hour has been very difficult. I don't have any subs. And it includes additional duties for the custodial staff, which is already impacted. And we just don't have enough participation right now. It's new. Um, because it's hard to find the staffing, my current staff has had to fill in. And this stretches them thin. It affects their morale. It affects the overall food service program, the elementary, the middle, the high school. Um, I often have to fill in, which affects my ability to focus on the overall food service program. I don't mind doing this, but I don't think it's the best use of my time. Um, we, just, we need to increase participation overall in the food service program, but with breakfast to keep up with the rising costs of food and of benefits. And my, one of my main goals is to make sure that I don't encroach on the general fund. This is becoming more difficult as the cost of goods and the cost of benefits go up. And lastly, I wanted to share with you the efforts that have been made to promote the breakfast program. Um, flyers have been put up at all the elementary schools on the bulletin boards throughout the halls. Um, on the desks in the main office, so when people come in, there's a little thing with flyers there. Um, it's gone in the newsletters. Each elementary has newsletters that go out digitally to all their uh, families, so our breakfast program information has been in there. There was a, an email sent out f directly from food services to all the family, all the elementary families announcing the breakfast program, and there is also information on the food services website. And we did a taste testing at Marin. Um, we surveyed about four breakfast items. It was pretty successful. I think there was a lot of good feedback from parents, from staff, from kids. Um, we have incorporated one of the items so far, and I'm working on another item. It's been very difficult to get that from the purveyors. And future efforts, I would like to do more outreach. I'm thinking of utilizing the PTA and maybe speaking at um, PTA meetings and try to kind of put together like a marketing team that could do more outreach and try to get the word out to more families about breakfast. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, questions or comments? Um, Sabina? <clears throat> I have other questions that I'll let other people talk and then I'll ask them later. But I, like, have taken my kids to breakfast every day. Thank you. But I missed, I was, like, traveling for work and I missed the taste testing. Oh. So if you could pretty please send me an email when you're going to do that again at Marin so that I can let my job know that I'm going to quit because I have to go to. I was so sad that I missed the taste test and everybody, all the kids were telling me how they like voted and they were having like a lot of fun with it. Yeah, well, I really want to do it at the other sites too. I'm so, so sad I missed you it. Go over to. Carson. I'm going to go to all th three of them. Okay, <laughs> great. You should be the breakfast ambassador. You've done a lot to help. Sign, sign me up. Do a little waffle. <laughs> you want me to dress up? Yeah. Right. yeah. All right. Put you in like a waffle. Is that what you said? Like a waffle yeah. costume? Yeah. All right. I'm going to look at everybody else. Thank you. One, well, of course, it's the most grave thing is having more kids involved, right? I mean, participating in the program. And, and 
I just thought when you had mentioned about the outreach, I mean, that's the most important. And I'm thinking of um, at your PTA meetings you mentioned, going to the PTA meetings, if the marketing you do there would include the free ta tasting, so that if the parents said this is yummy, then maybe mm -hmm. they would encourage their kids to, to have breakfast, mm -hmm. you know, sure. when you would do that. Um, and I don't, I don't know, well, I'm assuming that that's legal for you to spend some of the money to do that. But you'll figure that out. But, but the other part is, is if that also those, the testing things you're trying, if it could be maybe samples at lunch times that kids could, um, you know, oh, this is this is what's offer, offered at breakfast. This is pretty good. I think I I want to participate or or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. that maybe that's another way that to encourage um, the kids to. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate your input, and I think it's important to include the kids and the parents because the kids, you know, can say they want to eat the breakfast, but you have to get the parents to allow them to do it. So right, right. So. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's totally awesome. I would have loved to have breakfast with all my friends. Um, yeah, I, lost I had a couple of ideas and also a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. my, one of my ideas, which kind of uh, contributes to what Clementina was saying, is um, have you guys done most of your marketing to the parents or like through the students, through like flyers at school or? like newsletters or how to, to has it like been too. mainly targeted at parents or like parents through the students? I think it's mostly through the parents if the parents read the newsletter, if the parents read the email. Um, but the posters are up for the kids to see and you know what, like at the elementary schools there's um, I mean, I work a lot at OSHA View, so I do see there's a lot of kids that show up there. Like, I've counted 30 kids in the room before, and there was like eight kids having breakfast. Mm. So I think it might be interesting to survey those kids and find out why are you not eating breakfast? What Do you eat breakfast at home? Do you not eat breakfast? Do you not know about the breakfast? Do you not, you know, do you not like the breakfast? Yeah, yeah, yeah that makes sense. Um, I know that I had talked about this a while ago when we had first had the discussion. I remember asking if high school students were able to help and I think you had said that that was really difficult, there were some like liability issues and I wanted to revisit it and ask like what the reasons were for high school students not being able to participate or maybe, I don't know, be that person who can work for one hour just because oh. I know that there's a lot of high school students especially in the mornings who have a free first or second I have a free second um, makes it easier to wake up after these board meetings because I get an idea. extra hour of sleep and I'm sure there are some high school students who maybe like on one day of the week or once every two weeks or something would want to wake up and get paid to do one hour of work mm -hmm. um, in the morning while they would have that free period. And so I don't know if that's a possibility, but I could see it. I don't remember what I said to that okay. last time, but I think it's a great idea. Um, yeah, I just have to figure out how to advertise that. Yeah, yeah. It would be super helpful. I'm. I mean, I had talked earlier about Leadership Kids being a great resource for like bouncing ideas off of, mm -hmm, and I'm mm -hmm. sure if you wanted to come talk to leadership, or even I could go talk to leadership and then come talk to you. Um, Either or both. Yeah, yeah. And then finally, you had said that a lot of other districts had found that students, a lot of students who qualify for free and reduced lunch don't participate in programs that would like give them free and reduced lunch or breakfast. Mm -hmm. and. Has have people figured out why that is, or has there been research on that? Um, I don't really know. Yeah, I haven't looked deeply into it, but all of the information that I've read has said that it's a challenge, that mm -hmm. breakfast in general is a challenge, getting kids who are eligible for free and reduced lunch to eat breakfast at school is a challenge. and. 
there's there is a lot of data out there and information out there and a lot of effort um, that's made to try to increase that participation and reach more kids. Yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm curious if there's something there that we could understand and it could help increase participation and also yeah. give students who may not be having breakfast breakfast. There are programs, there, there are suggestions, um, there are strategies for addressing that. Most of those strategies are, are directed towards schools with really low, free, and reduced populations. Mm, okay. So I could, I could get into that with you another time about. Yeah, I was just curious. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Could I just um, mention something that I think may have come from you uh, way back when, um, which is that have you had an opportunity to talk like to Berkeley schools that I understand are pretty successful? Right. They, Berkeley schools have a universal breakfast program because they have a high free and reduced population. San Leandro also, yeah. It doesn't really make sense for us financially. So they, that. they offer it during the day. So they give it to everybody after school starts. Like, so kids don't have to come early to get breakfast. Yeah. That's what the high school does, too. Because we, we have our, I don't know if it's technically breakfast, but I know a lot of kids. Oh, so that's like a second chance breakfast. That's what it's technically called okay. a second chance breakfast. So the breakfast at the high school is served at uh, the break time, which is somewhere around... 10, 30, 11. Yeah. And that gets um, swarms of people in the yeah. cafeteria. Yeah. Huge amounts so of kids. Could we sense. model somehow off of that or like looking at why all these, I mean, it might just be an age thing or is there any data from that? Or like data for no, Well, not data, but just why, why student, there's so much high participation at the high school but not at the elementary school. There is not. Okay. <laughs> it's also new. Yeah. So I think yeah. it takes time for people to know, to you know, for people to get the word out, for people to say, hey, yeah, my kid goes and has breakfast. You should try it. And what what time is the uh, elementary school break? Is it? I'm, it might be different. Now. They don't have a break. They don't, break. they don't have a break. They recess. Yeah, so from nine thirty to nine forty. When oh, okay, they yeah. have a recess while the yeah. during the early while the late birds are. But I think that's like yeah. ten minutes, right? Or yeah. something like that. So that would be hard to do a breakfast. Yeah. Okay, so if you were gonna do like a breakfast in the middle of school, you would have to readjust the schedule. Oh no, she was able hers is working. Yes, okay. Probably, yeah. Hey, I um, it's it seems like it seems like a lot of ideas are being thrown around. Um, I heard that you might visit the PTAs, you might give parents some uh, samples of what's going on. You talked about visiting the other uh, the other elementary schools with, the, uh, with the, the the sample thing that got folks excited over at Marin. Um, I've heard the idea about using some students for um, paid help in the morning. Mm -hmm. So, um, are are there any uh, further suggestions? Or I just have a few. Okay. Um, one, I, w I wanted to invite the other uh, board members to support me with this by having like a breakfast with the board member type thing um, at the sites that we represent. Um, I mean, you can have breakfast with me at Marin every morning. I'm, I'm there anyway, but making it like a thing. And so I like can invite, maybe inviting parents and like if they have questions and having like some coffee there for them and sure, they there, can just drill us. There's actually like a national breakfast week coming up. I want to say like it's in March or something. I can find out the date, but that might be a good time to, you know, celebrate breakfast and try different marketing ideas. And yeah breakfast with the board. Yeah, so I would invite my fellow board members to join me in that and um, maybe even bring a few dollars and, you know, buy some f some breakfast for some kids, you know, that are, that are circling, that are hungry. I don't know. We'll figure it out. But I, I invite you guys to, to um, join me in that. And um, the other, so whenever I 
go up to the schools, I see these really like nice signs that remind me of all the things that all the schools have. Um, so maybe if breakfast had one of those, uh, because there's a few things that I'll never forget. I know that chalk it up is going to happen because I see the sign. I see you know, every time walking up the steps, and then the other programs that <clears throat> Marin has and that um, Cornell have, like because there's kind of signs that so are like a banner, like a banner, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so I think that you know would be. Sure. I'll look into the cost of that. Um, I think that uh, you know. Um, Dr. Wells would be happy to help you with that. You don't have to take it all on yourself. Um, Dr. Wells? <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm getting used to this giving instruction thing. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, the other, um, was there, there's a, a part where um, you talked, or did you, I'm not sure if you talked about it or not, but uh, where after you did the um, tasting that the participation increased? Mm -hmm. um, it did. So. Yeah. I don't know if it's from the taste testing. It could just be because it was the second month of doing breakfast. Oh, I see. Or the third, it was a, the third, it was like the, the second and third month, yeah. Okay. So, I, sure. That would be great if it was because of the <laughs> breakfast tasting. <laughs> I guess if we tried it at other schools and participation went up, then we would know. Well, I'm the board liaison for Cornell, and I'd be happy to work with Sabina and have a breakfast with the board member Thank you. Uh, at that site. So I'll take you up on that challenge, Brian. All right. That would be great. Cornell needs it the most. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're at our item 14-2, California Dashboard. We've got some serious deep dive into the dashboard to do now. Woo. Hey. <laughs> wow. Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> board President <laughs> Wells, Superintendent Wells, Board President Chutain, uh, board members and community. Um, this almost rarely happens that there's an abundance of time at the end of the meeting. <laughs> so I'm going to enjoy it this evening. Sorry, Jacob. <laughs> abundance of time, it's 9.30. <laughs> I'm going to enjoy spending the time with you uh, this evening talking about the California School Dashboard. This is the third year of the California School Dashboard re reporting uh, data um, on schools and districts. And as noted in the backup, the school dashboard operates a little differently, quite a lot differently than metrics that were used in the past to evaluate school and district progress and performance. So um, prior, to, um, prior to the dashboard coming online, um, student achievement was measured mostly um, by looking at um, summative assessment scores. Um, there was a time where um, schools and districts uh, were responsible for an academic performance index, which was one score um, that um, indicated uh, the quality of that school and district. The magic number was 800. Um, and so we are moving away from sort of single tests or um, small numbers of items sort of determining school and district quality. Um, and we have this dashboard that reports um, state metrics, six state metrics that we're going to talk about this evening, um, and also five local metrics. So um, the local metrics came to you in November, and they will come to you again in June when we approve um, the LCAP for 2020-2023. So we've been sort of out of sync a little with our reporting, but we are going to get in sync. Um, so this California School Dashboard is an online tool. It measures how schools are performing in a number of areas. Um, and state and local data reported to the dashboard is expected to be used in the development of the LCAP. And in the prior template, that there were questions very specifically about performance levels as reported on the dashboard to be included in the LCAP. Some of that is changing. We do have a new LCAP template again. Uh, so some of that information is changing, but we are responsible to report our school and district's performance um, on the LCAP in the development of our LCAP. 
Um, and what's very different about the dashboard is that um, the way it works is that we are receiving a rating based on how we performed in a particular year compared to performance in a previous year. So there were several really good questions um, that um, board member uh, Vice President Duran asked that I, I'm hoping to recall and be able to incorporate into this presentation. One of those was having to do with this notion of percentile ranges and cut scores. Those don't exist. So what you might find from one dashboard to the next, one district's dashboard to the next, is that, for example, on the college and career indicator, a district might receive a rating of green. But if you look at their dashboard data, you might actually find that their percentage is lower than a different district, right? And that's because what we're interested in now is current year performance compared to past, past year performance. So as Dr. Wells sort of put it in a meeting that we had last, last year, uh, last week, we are now comparing ourselves with ourselves, right? So we're not being compared now necessarily with neighboring districts. We're not being ranked <coughs> as one of a thousand districts in the state of California, but we're really looking at how are we doing as a district and how are we doing as a school? So um, you'll see at the bottom, the graphic there shows that the color system is fairly intuitive. Uh, lowest performance, least desirable performance is red. Most desirable performance is blue. So this next slide uh, shows you our most recent results on the dashboard. And this, uh, this slide represents overall performance. And so in the areas of English language arts and mathematics, we um, received the highest rating, and we'll go sort of into some detail on this on the next slide, next couple slides. In the areas of suspension rate and graduation rate, we um, earned high performance. Um, and in the areas of chronic absenteeism and college and career readiness, we are uh, receiving a rating of, let's call that medium performance. There is no, you'll notice, no performance color for English learner progress. The uh, summative assessment uh, for English learners, um, the annual assessment for English learners has changed, and so we are waiting to have a couple years of um, data for um, LPAC in order to be able to provide a performance color. If we go to the next slide, I just wanted to provide uh, sort of some context for us in terms of when we look at our dashboard results. So what you see here are the state of California school dashboard results. So you'll see that we're in the areas of English language arts and mathematics, and that's students performance on SBAC for grades three through eight and 11, where our district's performance is in the blue. Uh, for the state of California, English language arts performance is in the green, but mathematics and mathematics performance is in the orange. Where in the area of graduation rate for the district, we are green, so also is the state. Um, in the area of suspension rate, where um, our rating is green, you'll see that uh, the state of California is at a yellow. I just uh, was peeking at an interesting article just yesterday that talked about finally after 10 years of seeking to make improvements in the disproportionate suspension uh, for African American students, we are beginning to see a reduction, right? So that might be some of what's reflected here. And then in the area of college and career readiness, yellow, and the district's also yellow, and chronic absenteeism, um, orange, and the district's rating is a yellow. So in the three years that we have been reporting on dashboard indicators, chronic absenteeism, we have two years of measures because that came online in the second year. And uh, college and career um, is also sort of, we've, we've got two years of solid data for that also. <coughs> So the next slide is uh, sort of shows a little bit more in depth um, our performance um, and how we arrived at these um, how we arrived at these performance levels. I won't read through all of the numbers because you can see those for yourselves, but I do want to explain how uh, this um, points above standard works for English language arts and math. So at every grade level. Um, grades three through eight and 11, there is a scale score that's identified as the minimum score needed for students to meet standards on the Smarter Balance Summative Assessment. And so uh, the average points above standard is that you take all of the scores earned um, by students on English language arts and the mathematics 
assessment, um, and then you calculate the distance from that minimum score at each particular grade level. And so on the average in our district, um, in the area of English language arts, the, the average for students on that assessment, um, the average score received is 64.6 .6 points above standard. And in the area of mathematics, the average distance from that minimum score required for meeting standard is 46.3 points. So we did receive the highest rating in that area. And I do sort of want you to notice that while those are both blue, you see for English language arts, it's 64.6 .6 points above standard. And for mathematics, it's a little less at 46.3 points above standard. So there's a little difference between those two numbers. But ultimately, both of those scores um, earn us the highest performance level um, in the area of English language arts and math. And so we're excited to report that. Um, you'll notice in the area of chronic absenteeism, um, we actually have the same chronic absenteeism rate. And because we didn't decline, we actually improved. Right. So that's good. Um, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And then in the area of college and career readiness, which we will also talk about, um, the percentage um, did decline slightly. When we talk about college and career readiness, we're talking about students who graduated in the 1819 school year. And so a part of the calculation of their college and career readiness is based on smarter balance summative assessment scores that they earned in the 1718 school year. So we still do sort of have a problem in terms of looking at some of this data with sort of looking at old metrics and using those metrics from you know sort of almost two years ago to have a conversation about what improvements are we making. So one of the questions um, Vice President Duran asked was, on, about weaknesses, maybe not weaknesses, but a, but maybe a challenge, right? We want to have conversations about how to support students this year and support students this year. And sometimes the metrics that we are looking at are a year or two old, right? Which just requires, I think, that we engage in more conversation about what metrics locally we might bring to the fore for consideration. Suspension rates, um, you will see, have continued to decline. Um, since in the three years that we report on the dashboard. And then our graduation rate, a slight decline here also from um, a slight increase from last year, but a slight decline overall. So these are our overall district results. The next couple of slides are going to show you um, for chronic absenteeism specifically and also for college and career specifically, some disaggregated data. So looking at some student groups, I highlighted these two in particular. Uh, first of all, because, oh, I'm not quite ready yet. First, because there have been a lot, we've had a lot of conversation about chronic absenteeism in a number of venues. Um, and also there was a, a request in particular to think about the college, talk about the college and career indicator. And also in our follow-up report that will come to you at the next board meeting, um, our site leaders will be here to talk about some of the other metrics and some of the other activities taking place at site. So I took these two so that they could have the other ones. So chronic absenteeism is students who miss 10% or more of the, of the school days in which they are enrolled. These absences can be excused and or unexcused. Um, and for the purposes of the dashboard, um, chronic absenteeism rates for grades kindergarten through eight only are reported. So if we go to the next slide, uh, this slide shows overall chronic absenteeism rates. And also then we'll show you the different rates of our uh, student groups on campus. Um, one, of the, one of the things not noted, but I did include this in a Friday update of, uh, maybe a few weeks ago, provided to the board, is um, identifying the student group size. So if you have a student group that's pretty small, you know, and then you've got maybe one or two students moving in or out of a group, that can have an effect on your overall score. So. Um, and that's with any metric, right? You want to be paying attention to the end size, to the student group size. Um, so here are our results. And then if we go to the next slide, um, you will see that then these results are broken out by um, student groups without, um, without regard to ethnicity. So English learners, students with disabilities, and students who are identified as socioeconomically disadvantaged. So these are not different students than students on the previous slide. These are, this is the same group of students, just broken out a little bit differently. Um, and I did, because I was curious, um, 
start to query some information about the ethnicity of our students who are English learner students with disabilities and students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, just to see the degree to which there's sort of this crossover with our um, different student groups. And so I can share that with you in a coming Friday update after I've had an opportunity to study that a little bit more. Um, so you'll notice here that our big improvement was uh, for students with disabilities who last year had a chronic absenteeism rate of 10, a little over 10%, and this year um, reduced that rate to 8.1. And so even though that rate is still fairly high because of the movement made, right, we are in a performance level of green. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of current and planned action, so one of the things that we have done this year is increase our frequency of monitoring students who have less than 90% attendance. I don't believe that prior to this um, metric coming on board with the dashboard, we were really paying attention to that. Um, and it's just been in the last couple of years that the state is even reporting this. So we do have a query that we can um, run uh, pretty frequently. I ran it last week um, and shared with the different sites. Here are the students that are identified on your list. You know who these students are. Tell me what interventions are in place. Tell me what additional supports you might need. So those are ongoing conversations. Um, conducting targeted outreach to families. You know, one of the things that we discussed, a couple things that we discovered when we looked at that list. Um, in the first place, one of the things we learned when we ran it pretty early on, and I saw a name on the list that I knew probably shouldn't be there, um, because I have some connection to the family personally, was that we were, um, w there was some um, error in our attendance accounting that was having students who were um, doing independent study and completing that independent study not receiving positive attendance credit. So that sort of goes to bullet number three, which is ensuring uniform and accurate attendance accounting. So I won't make any promises about what that's going to mean for the dashboard next year, but I will tell you that we did discover that that was um, happening, and so we've worked to address that. Um, I think that sort of speaks to this, right, bullet number two about conducting targeted outreach. So we, we really are trying to separate out, you know, independent study versus students who we know have some, you know, needs that are being addressed, right? And so really sort of going to those families and saying it's really important that you come to school, right, that sort of might not be the first level of intervention, right? We really want to support families that are, you know, um, experiencing struggle with sort of the source of the struggle, right? Um, but we also have um, enjoined this semester, um, we have at the elementary uh, licensed clinical social worker um, Heather Collins is our social worker for elementary. So she's going to be working with us this year to sort of continue to monitor these data, particularly at the elementary, to run these reports pretty frequently, to continue to look at are the same students appearing on these lists? Because you can drop off the list because the more days of attendance there are, the more days, more opportunity you have for positive attendance. So we're really excited to have somebody come on board. Um, and we're really sort of just piloting what that might look like, right? How do we build a system that's responsive to the needs of students who um, have less than 90% attendance? The other thing um, that we are wanting to do is um, take a look right now. This was one of the questions. Right now, we are administering the California Healthy Kids Survey through the month of January to students and to staff and also to parents. And so we're really interested in taking a look at that data to see if there is anything in there in terms of students reporting about connectedness to school or feeling that you know they have good relationships and are wanting to be at school that we might address in our local control and accountability plan. And then the last bullet is referring actually directly to the LCAP. So we do have an annual measurable objective in our LCAP that addresses um, chronic absenteeism, and right now, as stated, the um, objective, the measurable objective, is to maintain um, maintain five percent or less chronic absence. And so we haven't been there for two years. So we really have to. We want to revisit that. We don't want to just roll that over to the next LCAP. And then we really want to think about um, what are the actions that are going to get us there. At our last couple LCAP advisory meetings, we had an opportunity to look both at goal one and goal two. Here are here are the annual objectives. Here are the actions and services. What's the degree to which these things are aligned, right? Because we can have objectives and we can have actions 
and we can see no movement, right, if we don't have some good alignment, if we're not confident that the actions and services that we're identifying are gonna get us to the goal that we want. And so, uh, Trustee Duran, um, at our first meeting, coined this phrase, move heavy, right? And so we have an opportunity now, with this new data coming, right, to be able to say, so let's throw our caps over the wall, right, and really sort of set some aggressive targets, but then also really follow up with some feasible meaningful action in that direction. So that's chronic absenteeism. If you'd like, I can pause here for any questions, or I can plug right along. Oh, it seems like you want me to pause. I shall. Ladies first. Um, are students counted for chronic absenteeism if their absences are excused? Yes. Okay. And then the data that you had right here for current and planned act actions, is there a reason that it's only K through eight, or is there like a different set of plans for high school? So I will tell you this, that for the purposes of reporting on the dashboard, we're, we only report grades K through eight, but I also, only K through eight is reported. Um, and I think, I think actually that's maybe a good thing if you, when you look at sort of high school attendance, I think can be so different and is reported so differently and you're looking at period attendance and so what does that really mean when you're trying to determine chronic absenteeism? But I will tell you that I ran the report for K through 12 and I did share the information for high school with the high school. So we are having those conversations also at the high school and particularly at the high school. A lot of the concern around students who are having less than 90% attendance is not about independent study, it's about you know students who are having um, conditions that make it really difficult for the personal conditions and um, that make it difficult for them to be at school. And so we are, um, in terms of these planned actions, we are sort of also folding in um, our students at the high school. Um, but that's a, a lot more students. That's a lot more students currently. And when you're talking about targeted outreach, do you mean targeting students? You, you had said that you were focusing on students who had specific needs, or I just didn't quite understand what you were saying, and I was wondering if the targeted outreach that you guys are doing includes like focusing on those groups who have shown to need a little bit more attention? Yeah. On the attendance records? I think sort of targeted outreach means being purposeful about what communication we send to what group of students and for oh, what purpose, okay. I think, right? So um, not thinking about any particular student group, but just thinking about, you know, there might be sort of at a level one, some general communication that goes to all families about at the beginning of the year about, you know, positive attendance. And then there might be, when we are having families sign up for independent study, there might be some other communication that goes to those families because we have a lot of that occurring at the elementary. And then when we start to get into at the middle grades and at the high, grade, at the high school grades, um, students who are not coming to school for very different reasons, then that communication, that outreach would be different than that which is sort of general and specific. But certainly to your question, we could also look at um, who are the student groups that we, about whom we are the most concerned and how do we fold that outreach in to um, our work with those groups. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I just, I have, heard from a lot of my friends very like specific reasons about why they have a hard time coming to school or why they, like they have they, they are chronically absent um, and a lot of it like has to do with social and emotional reasons and I think that could be like paying attention to that and tailoring the targeted outreach that you're talking about here to student groups that have specific needs having to do with like their interactions with their peers and with the world, I think it could be a really helpful way of getting students to come to school more often. Because, I mean, for, for me, that's been, I think, the biggest reason that I've heard of students missing school. Um, yeah, that was, I think that was it. That's all I had to say. You can go. No, that, that was great. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one was kind of around, also around the targeted outreach for uh, families. Um, I would, makes sense that the things that are happening, but I'm just wondering uh, because the groups that are um, have the highest uh, rate of, of absence, it's a, it's a small, it's a smaller group. So I'm wondering if the outreach 
um, can be more intentional uh, and more direct uh, versus kind of grouping it all together, but specifically saying these groups are, these students are absent. So how can we directly figure out why these students are missing school um, and maybe, you know, uh, either talk, you know, speaking with them or speaking with parents or doing both to say uh, maybe they can, you know, share it. Uh, shine light on something that we're that we're missing to say that you know that's why um, they're missing just factors that are outside of um, that uh, and then the other um, kind of question I had was uh, on 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 our side of things um, are we thinking more creatively as to things that we can do on our end to um, increase and um, you know help with that you know because it's one thing to just go to everybody and say please come to school, but what are, what, are, what are we doing on our end to make things more inviting and to make it a more welcoming place? Because if we look on the list, it's welcoming, and the students that feel the most welcome, they show up and they come the most often. And the list goes, in, it goes directly in that order. And so kind of being intentional about it and really calling it out and saying that um, the predominantly the school is predominantly this, and so those students show up the, the most often. They're the lowest percentage of being absent because they, there's a certain feeling of belonging and welcomeness, and when you are the only black student in the class, it's not always as in, you know, maybe that's the case. Maybe if there was a clustering to where you knew when you got to that class there were going to be three other people that looked like you. Um, maybe or you know, I mean it could all be a factor. I'm not sure what it is, but being intentional about it and really kind of calling it out and what what can what can we do on our end versus always putting it all on the on the student. Um, I would say um, that you hit on what I think is a sort of a really important point, which is sometimes when we are looking at these. Um, metrics in isolation and we're thinking how do we get it up how do we get it up how do we get it up we're sort of thinking about what are some short-term measures maybe potentially that might increase that but really these metrics might be calling us to think about sort of some deeper issues right as you speak about and that that at that level when we're sort of really understanding like root causes right that then we can be our most creative but if we're at the surface just thinking about we need to improve attendance which certainly we do but like you said we want to be thoughtful about that so might this trigger us to think about goals that are found um, actions and and objectives that are found in goal one of our LCAP around right or in in goal two of our LCAP or even in goal three of our LCAP where we speak about like parent engagement and other things so I think there's an opportunity for us to use these data points to sort of really think about like what is the story and then think about and what do we do about the re root causes and not not just sort of the surface so I'm agreeing very much with you about that point in terms of sort of being creative and being intentional and being intentional I think means sort of really looking at what are the other data points that we might triangulate to sort of get a better sense of why this might be happening for groups. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I don't think we're going to solve it all, you know, no, tonight. tonight. But, um, you know, like bringing it up, having the, the, the conversation, um, you know, making, you know, myself and everybody uh, available and kind of pulling on the expertise of everybody to try and figure out how we can go about it. I mean, it's a team effort. We all have to try and figure it out. Agreed. I'm good. Thank okay. you. Okay. Go ahead. Ooh. I'm sorry. Just on this issue, um, I actually, I think I need to sit down and spend some time with you because mm. I'm, I have a really hard time wrapping my head around this dashboard mm. thing. I've tried for a year and a half now. I'm still struggling uh, because I think it's, I mean, I, I do see the usefulness of it to go from, uh, to see improvement or where we're at from one year to the next. But that's, to me, I mean, that's that's great, but it's only one thing. I want to see the bigger picture, too. And, for example, if you just go, could you go back to the, the, the chronic absenteeism, that one right there. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't get it, because if you look at uh, socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, 8.7 and then in this year or last year 10% but they're still the same color. Uh, students with disabilities 
in red at 10.3, they're, uh, they're in red. And then in what is their 2% points down, they jump to green. That's a huge jump. And based on what? And, uh, and AUSD in general and English learners, uh, one changed color and the other didn't. Why not? Why aren't they the same? I mean, it's like it's based on magic. Wait, both of them changed colors. They both went from orange to yellow. Uh, yeah, okay, sorry. But the point is the yellow, they're, they're the same, 5.4. Where is the difference between the orange and the yellow? Do you, what I'm saying is AUSD, AUSD in general went to a yellow at the same percentage, but the English learners were because, because they stay all it means is they stay the same. They stay the same. That's they why it's, I agree. It's a frustrating dashboard, as Marie said. All it's telling you is whether it stayed the same or got better. So because it's yellow, because it didn't move, so it doesn't mean, obviously, it didn't move. you can't look at the colors and say, and this is what I think you're getting at, That's and say, I'm oh, sure. this, is, so, this is doing well and this is doing badly. Is All correct. it's telling you is, well, this so was not the worst, and now it's the second worst. There's we're not comparing it against different districts or like a certain mm -hmm. threshold. We're just comparing it against ourselves. Right. Right, but there's no the previous year. for yeah. a real numbers to say that this has really gone mm -hmm. up and this hasn't. So I'm yes, and I'm going to say three things. The first is I would be happy to meet with you to explore the dashboard at length at any time that you want to have that conversation. The second thing I would say is that which, with each of these indicators, and I didn't bring it today, and I can certainly share it with you, there is, um, it's a five by five grid. And it gives a little more specificity in terms of sort of uh, where you start out, sort of what your percentage might be when you start, and then based on your performance, how that might sort of move you on the dashboard. I did the students with disabilities, that indicator is sort of, um, it's confusing, to, a little confounding to me because nowhere else do you see a group that could go from green, uh, red to green. So, um, and then the third thing I would say is sort of relative to this comment about sort of th thresholds or ranges or um, markers is I think that that's our um, that's our work in developing the LCAP is saying these are the these are the goals that we're setting. These are the objectives that we are setting. And then this is sort of merely helping us to track our progress. But this in and of itself maybe isn't a tool that we can sort of go to absent setting our own goals, right, about sort of student performance and student progress in the district. Yeah, because it, a, group, a student group, a subgroup could go from yellow to green or but it doesn't, we don't know where they started at. So, I mean, they could have started at, say, a 40 percentile, and they moved up to 60 percentile, but 60 percentile is not, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. sorry. 60 percentile is nowhere where we're satisfied, but every parent then goes, oh, my kid's now green, so that's cool. And so, all these colors are, are, are really, I think, not addressing the real issue of how is my kid doing academically, and it's based on, on some kind of scale or some range. Yeah, Otherwise, so I would say, and then I'll move on to the next um, indicator, I would say that this tool really is, is more useful for looking at school and district performance and progress. This isn't a tool for a parent to go to and say, how is my child doing? This is a tool that you might go to and say, how is, my, how is the district my student attends performing? And then if you wanted a sense of whether that performance was good or not good, then you might look at some other dashboards and sort of compare. But this is, this is not gonna give you the level of detail that a parent maybe is gonna want to know um, how the school is performing. It's one set of data that might provide some um, information about district level of performance. And so I'm gonna um, slide on to the, oh. I have it. Thank you, oh yay, thank you. Board member Mala. I'm going to go to college and career indicator. 
And so there are several ways that you can meet this indicator. And there are a couple that I actually didn't include because we don't have um, military sort of type programs and some other things in our district. So um, the most common ways in our district one might meet this indicator. First, you have to graduate from high school, right? That's the, the baseline of the students who graduated. Then in addition, uh, what number or percentage of those students earned at least a three on uh, the English language arts and math summative assessment? Um, what percentage of students um, completed um, a, an A to G course of study with a grade of C or better? And this um, indicator you will notice also has some additional pieces that were not in the original um, in the original rolling out of the dashboard. So they've sort of made up the ante on this one. So not just meeting A to G requirements, but also CTE pathway completion and having to do with smarter balanced and or taking college coursework and or performance on the AP exam. And then the other here is a score of three or higher on two advanced placement exams. If you go to the next slide, there are more ways to meet it. Um, CTE pathway completion, state seal of biliteracy, and um, college credit coursework. So if you go to the next slide, so though you can meet it in more than one, but you only count as meeting it once in one. So overall, our rate did um, decrease. And um, the, the most, where we, I think, find the, the most students meeting this indicator is based on performance on the Smarter Balance Summative Assessments. Um, we know that from 2018 to 2019, for our students in 11th grade, we did see an increase both in English language arts and mathematics for the performance on Smarter Balance. So when we look at this dashboard a year from now, I will predict that the color will change because of because we had a notable increase in smarter balance summative assessment performance this year, and so then here you can see um, the um, indicator rates for all of the other student groups. I did put a little note at the bottom here. Um, last year, the California Department of Education began for the first time to um, collect and report data about um, students going to college, actually actually enrolling in college. And so the data at the bottom is just pointing out. So some of the data at the top, I think, is very concerning to us when we look at the low percentages. And then this note at the bottom I added because 81% of um, AUSD seniors yeah, who graduated in 1718 um, enrolled in college, either two-year, four-year, in-state, out-of-state, within 12 or 16 months of high school graduation. So again, this sort of speaks to what are the what are the goals, and then what are the metrics that we are going to monitor. Um, there is a report, a college tracker report that we have shared once with the board before, and we do have it and can share it with you again. And it provides again more information about when students graduate from college, and it's just related to, excuse me, graduate from high school, it's just related to college attendance, what percentages of students and in what student groups are attending college within a certain time frame after graduating from high school, what percentage of those students are graduating from college within four years or five years. And so I think some of that data is also useful to present because I think this, um, presents sort of a, a pretty bleak picture and we might wonder what we're doing here. And so then we go, we're gonna go to the next slide, which shows um, some different student groups. But then I wanna pop down to this next slide because then I also thought it might be useful to share with you graduation rate information, right? Um, so we have, you know, overall in our district an almost 95% graduation rate um, and you will notice the slide, two slides above, showed some percentages of students identified as African American who are uh, identified as college career ready, and yet we have a 100% graduation rate for African American students. Um, and so I think we want to sort of be looking at what are the different sources of data and, and how are they how are they helping us. And then go to the next slide. This is more graduation rate data. And then go down here. I think for this indicator, um, to the we're going to go to the last slide. I'm going to be finished. Um, I think here there are. I think there here, really, first of all, is a need for us to identify what is our district's goal as it relates to college and career readiness, and clearly articulate that in our LCAP. Um, and then what are the priority actions that are going to get us there? 
and not wait for this dashboard to be released every year and then say, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? Um, because it's giving us some information, but if, if it's not aligned with what we've identified as goals, then right, it has some limited usefulness. And then I think um, there is an opportunity for us to revisit several of our goals in the LCAP around this, in particular as it relates to advanced placement, which we our current metric is 45% of students in grades 11 and 12 will take at least one AP class. Um, there is information about access to CTE classes. Do we want to make that, do we want to make that language maybe more forceful? Do we want to sort of set some stronger targets around CTE participation, knowing sort of our you know, the limits of our programs at our high school. Um, and then also in the area of UC, CSU, A to G eligibility, do we want to set some other targets? And then also I think a couple other things. We've got um, some policies on the books that might be confounding our efforts maybe to increase this percentage uh, unintentionally. So we've got language about if you take a college class, unless that class is needed for graduation, it doesn't come on a transcript. So it may well be that students are taking college classes that might increase this percentage, but right now we have a policy on the books that doesn't allow for those courses to come on board. So I think just sort of looking at some other pieces um, and making sure that we have a, um, some clear goals, some clear actions that are prioritized metrics, and then how are we going to monitor that over time. Thank you so much for indulging me this evening, and that concludes my report. Thank you very much. Well, we look forward to getting part two. Yes. Sorry, yes. Uh, Here's the last slide. Yes. Next meeting. Yeah. Okay. Can I just echo part of what you're saying, which is I think one way to get around the, the sort of lack of utility of the dashboard, or maybe I won't go that far, but is the, just to do what you said, which is to instead say, what is our goal? How many, what percent? I mean, to me, looking at the percentage of students who are classified as prepared, it seems quite low. I was really surprised. And we're actually not that much above the state average, which is also very surprising because we're much higher than the state on virtually every other indicator. So I think that's a good starting point is, you know, not watching the sort of green and yellow move around, but instead to have a, a conversation about how do we get above 70%. Um, you know, we are sending most of these kids to college. So what, what is it that's, um, what is it that needs to happen? Is it a data problem? Is it a, an educational problem? Is it a program structure? Um, but I think that I appreciate that you frame it as that's a way to go forward is for us to actually set goals so that we can measure our own accomplishments. Okay, so thank you very much, Director, uh, Assistant Superintendent Williams. Um, I wonder if you can bring up the uh, upcoming topics for our, our next board meeting. And then, un unfortunately, board, I, I am going to need to reconvene closed session for just a couple of minutes, very briefly. Um, um, I sent it to Frank, and you said that you'd be able to present it tonight. Dr. Wells, do you remember that? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> I think um, it, it, it it's appear that I have to take ownership of oversight on my part on the upcoming agenda item is what we're looking for, and it's not there, so uh, my apologies for that. Oh, I really need people to see this. If you email it to Jackie, she can project it directly from her seat. Okay.
have sent it, Jackie. I don't know how long it's going to take you to get it. What are we talking about? Upcoming agenda items. Perhaps while that's, uh, and I am um, also just about. Can we talk through the items that people wanted to add um, already before we pull that up? Because Clementina raised the diversity policy, contracting policy. Somebody raised the superintendent contract approval. Did you raise an agenda item? Mm -mm. No, Clementina raised both of those. Both of those. Okay, got it. All right. Um, <clears throat> yes, and I also I, I also heard the contract uh, limit for superintendent's mm -hmm. discretion, uh, tiebreaker for minority business, uh, and that was all I heard new from today. I added one, uh, another one, which was uh, maybe. It's a Freudian slip, but it was evaluation of the board. Oh, that was in the questions. Evaluation of the board. <coughs> okay, so anyhow, um, next meeting we have a very full agenda. We have um, the superintendent's mid year evaluation, uh, we have the budget audit report for last year. Uh, a number of contracts that have to do with the uh, Marin Elementary rebuild and other uh, further contracts for Russian View, perhaps. Um, the SARCs, the School Accountability Report Cards, um, we're going to hear more about the plans for increasing enrollment and uh, the part two of uh, Assistant Superintendent Williams' uh, report on student achievement. Okay, um, but. What I particularly wanted the board to see is that in order to prioritize all of the agenda items for the rest of the year, um, I think the board members in our agenda meetings have heard that we're, I, I think, uh, between 60 and 70 items are in our issues bin, and we have a very limited amount of time for the rest of the year, and we have a number of big items that must be heard. Uh, you know, the budget uh, looms large in the second semester. We'll be having the... Um, information on the governor's uh, budget, on the revise, we're going to have to have our second interim report and we're finally going to have to pass our budget. And um, so to prioritize all of these items in the issues bin for the rest of the year because I, I don't think that we can get to everything. Um, I'm proposing that we start our meeting, our next meeting with the workshop to sort the issues uh, out according to our three district objectives. And then we'll, uh, the, the board will make group decision on uh, what we can prioritize and how to fill all of those remaining meetings for this year. Okay. Um, so a, a workshop before the meeting? Yeah, so what I was, we're thinking about maybe starting at 5.30. Would the closed session be in between the workshop and the meeting? Um, yeah, so we'd start with the workshop, then we would go into closed session for the mid-year evaluation, and then we would have the um, open session. Would that be enough time, like an hour, to sort out 60 to 70 items? Um, I, I think that what we'll have to do is we're going to have to put up a number of, of um, those big white sheets, right. and everybody's going to have to take a chunk, and we're trying to have to try to sort them out, and then it'll be like a group activity, so it's not going to be like sitting at a table talking about things. It will all have different color markers and such, and we'll be able to um, make our own you know, priority choices. It'll maybe be sort of like putting stars up on. I like it. It's very you know, camp. Like, yeah. Yes. Do you... But, you know, and then we'll continue to sort it out. We don't have to, you know, we, we just have to get some kind of clarity about things that we really, really want to get to, you know. So it doesn't have to be perfect. We just all need to be a part of this decision. Do you think we can get sent um, the items in the bin before the meeting so we could just kind of have... Sure. 
Okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and I need to clean up the issues bin before I send it out. So that's one thing I need to do um, to make sure that they're all properly stated and, and clear. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. So yes, I'll make a note of that. Yes. So this bin, is that basically board members asking for something to be agendized? Uh, yeah, and, it's, and also in addition to that, there's also things that, that maybe come up at the schools or something that the superintendent might put into the issue spin or something that he wants to bring forward to the board. So it's not just um, the board requests. It can, it can come in from different directions. No. Audrey, I have to go, but... Okay, um, and then uh, if I can reconvene closed session for just about three minutes. The board will lean to closed session.